Hello and welcome to Android Design in Action. This week we've got a jam-packed show where we're going to take you through some of the redesigns of the Google Play applications. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by some special guests from the Android Design team this week. Um, so as always, I, I am your host, Nick Butcher. And in New York we have... Hey guys, Roman Nurek here. And over in Mountain View, we have our special guest, Marco and Owen. Do you want to introduce yourselves a little bit, guys? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Marco, and I lead user experience for Google Play. Hi, I'm Owen Otto. I'm the lead designer on the Google Play Music app. Great. So thanks very much for joining us. So without any further ado, let's jump into uh, some of the processes behind the redesigns. Great. So let's get started. So Google Play, you're probably familiar with it. Uh, but just as a quick introduction, Google Play is the media offering from Google. It basically covers all your content from games to apps, music, books, movies, and magazines. It's the place where you get your content. It's the place where you enjoy it. So today, we're going to be talking about the redesign. Particularly, the three key words that are going to go across the presentation is how we design it responsive, how we made it responsive, modular, and emotional at the same time. So we had three goals in mind when we redesigned the Google Play suite of applications. One was to create consistency across Play, to populate content dynamically, and to create efficient layout on web and device. So creating consistency. Basically, if you have been using Google Play in the past, you would have seen that we had a lot of different ways to represent content. And we thought that we sort of needed to make it uniform in order to create an experience that felt familiar to people. Populate content dynamically means that while we had ways to display content in a dynamic way across devices and web, there were certain types of content, particularly collections, that couldn't be displayed dynamically. For example, you will remember those tiles that were promoting different collections of content. Those tiles had to be manually drawn, generated, exported in JPEGs. And so we couldn't either um, propose content based on your preferences, collection based on your preferences, because we had to produce those tiles beforehand. And also, it was a very labor-intensive process. When we talk about efficient layout, it's not about the layout being efficient, but it's rather make our work more efficient. So we had to design for a lot of different screens and platforms, including the web. And we just wanted to have a system so that designers could define and design their, uh, their, their layouts once and apply them to all platforms so we could focus more on the new features and the cool stuff rather than translating the same thing over and over again. So let's jump into the solution and the design principles that uh, took us through this journey. So everything starts with cards. The interesting thing about cards is that it is this atomic element that defines an entity, that defines an object. And, and so rather than, designing for, rather than designing grids, which is a sort of outside-in approach, where you have grids and you put stuff in it, we thought about cards being this atomic element that creates spaces from the inside out. So multiple cards shows up on your layouts and define the content that you see. Let me get into some examples. So a card is great because, like I said, it contains objects, whether they are applications, or albums, or movies, or magazines, or books, or even people, or artists, and so forth. They basically can contain any type of thing. And by being in the same module, we are able to display things next to each other, no matter what kind of entity they are. The other great property that cards have is their ability to be in different shapes. So we design a lot of different cards so that layouts could be more interesting and hierarchical. So we had what we call tiny cards, or small cards, or big cards. And cards can also be displayed in multiple orientations in order to accommodate different layouts. We also have what we call a medium card, or a list view type of card. 
So there are two things that having different sizes accommodate for. One is that they create hierarchy. They can show things to be more important by being bigger and also they accommodate for different informational, informational purposes, meaning they can have more or less white space in them to show more or less information. For example, in the store, when we find something that you may really like, we put it in a bigger cart which has a bigger info area in order to display more reasons about why you may like it. Or maybe uh, we can display people that plus one it and so forth. And same we do on other applications and you will see that on music later. Another key element of our design are canvases. So once you understand cards, you also understand how your application is basically just a canvas on top of which elements are displayed. So it doesn't matter if the canvas is the store or music or whatnot. The point is that you have content that is displayed on top of these canvases. Somehow our design tries to be APK agnostic in a way that you may, want, you may see in the future a book in the music application. Why not? The store is a perfect example where all the content come together in one place. Another great example of canvases is what we do today in the movies application. If you're familiar with it, when you pause a movie, you basically see the actor that is there. You see a similar movies where the, the actor has been participating in. And this is just a canvas. It is a canvas where we display on top of it a person card and a list view card with a bunch of movies in it. It's just about canvases. The content lives on top of them. Another notion that is key to our design is the notion of clusters. So once you have multiple cards next to each other, because of the psychology, visual psychology law of proximity, you perceive it as one, one unit, a cluster. And that allows us to display collections in this way. We also made these collections to be dynamic and follow that hierarchy that I talked about before by allowing a cluster to have different modules in them. And because we designed those cards beforehand to be plugging into each other through heights they are uh, following the same structure, we can basically display clusters that have different types of cards in them and still feel as a unit, as you see here. Also, naturally, the clusters, they work across our typical canvases like phones or tablets and web and, and beyond. This led us into this responsive layout philosophy. When we talk about responsive layout, we're talking more about a design approach rather than the responsive web design. So we're not talking about designing your website to respond to different canvases, but rather how, as designers, we thought about how our layouts would expand across multiple screen sizes. And this is what we define here as responsive layout and responsive design. So as you see, we took in consideration all the typical canvases from phones to tablet 7 inch to tablet 10 inches and typical laptops. We always had all those canvases in mind and we kept on designing throughout these canvases across the whole process. We didn't start from phone or from a particular tablet. The process took us through all these canvases and all we were thinking about was how many columns these layouts will be supported on. It's just the number of columns. We ended up almost not calling phones phones anymore, but just calling them four inches or three inches, or maybe two columns layout, three columns layout, etc. Uh, let's look. Let's get into the output a little bit, and then we will jump into into music, which is a great example of how these principles are applied in practice. But some examples that I want to show in these layouts are, for instance, this is the store, and you can see how the same types of clusters scales across all screens. In particular, this particular movie is recommended to me bigger because a friend of mine plus one it. And you see how its prominence hierarchy is scaled across a phone, a seven inch, and a 10 inch tablet, growing in size and allowing other content to display next to it by keeping that hierarchical relationship. On phone, you don't see other content part of the same cluster just because the space doesn't allow that. But when you get to the 10 inch tablet, instead we have a very beautiful big cover with other related content next to it, which is recommended to me. Or talking about modularity, 
Uh, we also apply the same principles in the store in the way we show our banners, in the way we apply our photography to our collections. For example, here you see that we have an author photos next to the content and you see how we show more or less content according to the number of columns supported by the particular device. And you also see how the photo shifts a little bit. So on phone, it sh shifts a little bit to the left in order to always be centered in that particular place. But this responsive layout, this efficiency, is also applied to the way we started producing these assets, this photography. It is always a 16 by 9 photo that scales and moves a little bit across all devices. And the same is true even for our banners. Finally, about familiarity, um, like I said before, we want to be as much as possible APK agnostic. Our experience has to feel just like one experience. And so by making all layouts look and feel the same, you have these transitional points, for example, that feels really natural and smooth. For example, in the books application, we have a set of recommendations at the bottom. And when you expand those recommendations, you land into the store, but in reality, the view is exactly the same. So the user will just feel like he's expanding uh, his collection. He wants to see all the elements present in the collection, and he won't necessarily think about, now in, I just landed into a different APK. So this allows us even to mix our applications more. And I guess creating some cross-vertical cross opportunities across our play applications. Finally, about familiarity, by applying the same design principles across all the play application suite, you basically see how we start generating a type of brand that uh, happens to be visible across all, all of them. It's just very recognizable, it's very playful through the very colored action bars, through this cards type of metaphor, through this grid. Um, it really starts feeling like something that differentiates from other applications present out there, and it feels very googly. Now we're going to talk about music, so I'll let Owen to continue. Hi, now I'm going to give you a little walkthrough on how we applied some of the principles Marco was just talking about to the design of a music app in specific. And I wanted to start with just perhaps a prov provocative idea uh, within the design community. Um, there's this notion that we should be designing for mobile first that's very popular lately. You know, Previously, maybe people were designing web apps and then they were kind of figuring out how to scale them down to the phone, which we realized was a bad, ide bad idea. Maybe we should focus on the phone first. And I think where we've moved on to as is possibly a next step in this evolution, which is designing for everything at once. So as Marco mentioned, we were thinking about not just the phone, but the seven inch tablet and the 10 inch tablet and the web, and even in music case, music's case, the TV. So practically speaking, one trick that we use to approach this problem is we found that if we, on a first pass, we kind of think about the phone in portrait and the tablet, the 10 inch tablet in landscape, that this sort of stretches the design and really makes us um, think through things in a way that scales. So I'm going to give you a little demo of the music app with a phone in portrait and the tablet in landscape. And I'll kind of talk about these principles that Marco was mentioning as well as just showing you some cool things in the music app. So this is our Listen Now page. It's sort of the home screen in the app. The basic idea of this is, you know, when you have a music subscription service and you suddenly have millions of tracks at your fingertips, it can be a little daunting to figure out what to play. So this screen tries to be your concierge. It knows your taste and tries to pick what you may want to play next to make this easy. And this really shows the, the grid system that Marco was talking about and how it scales and solves the problem on both the phone and the tablet. So what you see here is we have a two column grid on the phone and the uh, five column grid on the tablet, as well as different card sizes. There's a sort of smaller medium sized card on the phone with the Daft Punk at the top and this very large card on the tablet. And it just brings a familiar 
experience to the user between both form factors, as well as making it easier for us to design and easier for engineers to implement when we reuse these grids and card systems. Next, I wanted to show you what an artist page looks like. So this is the page for uh, She and Him. They have a new album out now. And the thing that we thought was really interesting in this layout here is in opposition to a kind of typical tablet layout, like imagine a, a Gmail app where you have sort of one column that has all of the messages and on the right is sort of an expansion of one of those messages. We decided to go a route here on the tablet where we really stick with just a one one panel, and but we make the graphics really large and beautiful and immersive. As well as by using the cluster layout, the same one that I was talking about before on the Listen Now screen, you can scale up to fill the page nicely. You can also see in action on this page the cluster model that we were talking about before that spread out throughout all of the play apps where you can have different sections, in this case related artists, and you can expand them to get to more. Next I want to show you our playlist screen. One of the really cool things we have in the service is we actually have a, a team of editors who are sitting around making these awesome playlists. Things like, I like this one called Intro to Nordic Metal. So you can learn about new genres you don't know anything about or keep up to date on a genre that you're really into. This is one I've been listening to lately that's on Indie Electronic. One of the really nice things that we came up with on this page was we wanted to kind of continue that design that I was showing on the artist page where we have the big immersive graphic at the top. But when we got to the playlist page, we're like, what do we do? Because the artists, there's a lot of artists on this page. And we struck upon the idea of just doing this kind of rotating carousel so you can see uh, many different artist photos of all the, from all the songs that are in the playlist. Another interesting thing here about the, you know, the relationship between the phone and the tablet in landscape is you can see over here on the song list on the tablet, we've got a little bit more room here. So rather than showing the song title and the artist name right next to each other, as we do on the phone, we spread them out into separate columns on the tablet. And you can also bring in a little bit more information on the tablet, like the song duration, which just doesn't really fit nicely on the phone. Another example of this same kind of principle is uh, in our Now Playing bar, which you see at the bottom of both the phone and the tablet, which shows you the currently playing song and gives you a few controls. Now on the phone where it's, it's, there's not a lot of space, we just have a play button in addition to the song info. But on the tablet, we give you a full you know, previous button and next button and even thumbs up and thumbs down so you can do some rating. So it's just that you, you can take the same elements and uh, just add a little bit more on the tablet. But you still maintain that consistency and reusing the same components from an engineering perspective. You know, one what? of the things that I wanted to call out really quickly um, is that this isn't like two separate apps. You know, throughout this entire you know, presentation and demo so far, you guys have basically been showing the same app on a phone and a tablet. It's just that the individual elements in the app, the individual elements within the now playing bar and within the, the kind of song list, uh, those stretch and those kind of uh, realign themselves, reposition themselves. That's one of my favorite things about this app is that it's, it's truly responsive to design at, at the individual component level. Yeah, that's really important to our approach. A couple other things I wanted to mention. One, um, one cool thing we did on the phone, because we, we didn't have room for those next and previous buttons, we have these little touches like you can swipe to go to the next song. It's pretty cool. And um, the next piece I want to talk about is our Now Playing screen. This again shows the idea we were talking about before where the same design when you have these large graphics scales to both both form factors. Maybe the graphic gets cropped a little bit differently, but it still is beautiful and immersive. And again, you can um, you can swipe to go to the next track on the now playing screen. It's pretty nice. The last piece I wanted to talk about is our uh, Q UI. This is where you can see 
what songs are coming up next. And here there's some other nice gestures, like you can swipe to remove songs if you don't want to hear one. Now on the tablet, we did a nice little touch to just customize for the, the tablet and use this space well, which is just that rather than making this be a full screen like it is on the phone, the Q, we made it just be a, a pop-up. So you can still say, stay in your, your now playing screen without kind of having to leave to go somewhere else. So that's the basic idea, is to design for the phone and tablet and think about all the other screens at the same time. And a lot of these components can be reused and scale with just slight tweaks to, cut, to optimize for the form factor. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for going through that. That's a, a brilliant whirlwind tour of uh, the card's philosophy behind uh, Google Play and how to apply it. Um, I had a few questions I wanted to pick up on. Um, so you said you're trying to think about all um, devices at once when you're designing. Like practically, how how do you go about doing that? I mean, uh, do you have like a large canvas on, with all the different screen sizes on at once, or like, how do you actually go about doing this? You want to take that? Sure. <laughs> so I think one tact is the one I was mentioning, which is when we're we're going in deep on a design. We may think we may narrow the scope down at first to the phone in portrait and the tablet in landscape. Mm -hmm. But I think another key piece is that we worked on we worked on the store app um, everywhere in great detail at first. So this allowed us to then learn a lot about the patterns and how they work on the different form factors, and we could bring that back to each of the, the different vertical apps. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to say about a good technique for having a suite of applications to be consistent, to basically really invest on one first in order to get to learn all the lessons that needs to be learned and to do the best tweaks on the layouts and then sort of expand that to other applications. There's a lot of code that can be reutilized and that becomes very useful. We're actually moving into a space where we try to make those, those, those components more part of a framework. And that will be the ultimate goal, to really have these components to be called by any play application and just inherit a lot of properties. Uh, from the design side, I wish you could come to our office because it's pretty interesting to see the way we work. Most of the time you see people, for example, working on Illustrator and multiple canvases representing phones and tablets next to each other and just copy and pasting elements from one another, see if they work. I think it's very important from a design perspective to have tools that allows you to see things at the same time to support canvases. And I think a lot of applications that we use today have made a great progress allowing for that. Cool. One of the questions I had was in terms of how you communicate with engineers. So um, this is actually something that we've covered before. Uh, we've covered this when Alex Faborg from your team uh, joined us. Um, but just wanted to get your take. So when, during the process of designing uh, the Google Play client apps as well as you know, the Google Play music app, um, can, can you share any tips and tricks or anything like that from the process of working with the engineering team? Um. So one important thing for us is to be very specific. So without entering, skipping all the details about how we get to design those applications in the first place and all the creativity that goes into it, but focusing on the specs, if you wish, which is where we have a very tight collaboration with engineering, um, we need to, we make red lines, we make a lot of very detailed specifications uh, because, you know, it's really important to produce mocks, and it's really important to define all paddings, all font sizes, everything that is necessary to make this layout to be the way we want it to be. But like I said before, if you have these modular places in mind, it's really important to get to a very uh, precise level of definition the first time, but after that is done, there's a lot of code that can be shared afterwards. So uh, what happened is that we had to produce a lot of red lines and specifications, especially for the store, which shipped first. But after that, we managed to have engineering to be talking to each other and get a lot of that information almost for free, um, which was which was very important. Also, so we, is that, sorry? 
Is that another example of your outside in, um, inside out, sorry, rather than outside in approach? So by going deep and working on the Play Store and defining, you know, detailed red lines for different sizes of elements, you are then just able to say, use the same yes. um, elsewhere. Yes, exactly. And um, and about documentation, documents are never enough, and they keep on changing. So we also have a specific website, which is where we post all our materials. And they are more accessible, and this is where engineering can go and get all the information that they need. Plus, you know, we are lucky. We, we work next. Uh, we, we we work next to the engineering team. We we are part of the same team. We're in the same building, and so nothing can be better than face to face. Uh, of course, it's 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 obviously very hard to get to the right level. Of, of specification by simply writing documents, especially when you get to motion design and all those nuances that Owen has shown, like the playlist design, uh, if you don't sit next to each other. Yeah, I think one other thing I'd add that applies that we really did in the, the Google Play redesign and just applies to working with engineers in general is to s get, get the engineers involved really early in the process. So. I started meeting with engineers and presenting, you know, when we just had really rough sketches of, you know, like the information architecture and and kind of a rough idea of how different features would work. Not not beautiful mocks, not, you know, things that were, you know, redlined out or anything, but just kind of the rough strokes. And through that, we we get everyone's feedback early on and and um, also learn about things that might be technical issues that might we might want to work around in the design or or tweak to make sure that we have a really good user experience at the end of the day. Oh, well, thanks. I want to ask a quick question about um, the awesome use of the action bar and the translucent background. Uh, so hopefully people noticed it in the demo there, but um, one of my favorite features of the app is that on the many screens, like the artist screen, for example, you start off with a fully um, translucent action bar. And then as you scroll down the content, it fades in a background color for it. Um, for me, it, it works brilliantly for making the most of the imagery as well as you know working with the action world pattern very very flexibly. Uh, can you give us some um, some background on how you came up with that, or uh, you know what were your design goals of that kind of uh, for that piece? Yeah, I mean, I think basically the idea was just try to um, we really wanted to focus on the imagery, and by sort of making that the the action bar be transparent, it really made the image pop more and be more of the centerpiece of the screen. And uh, then, I don't remember who came up with the idea of it kind of fading into orange, but roughly it was to solve the problem of that when you scrolled down, you needed to make sure that you could uh, see the controls when the picture was, wasn't there anymore. And um, so it just wound up being kind of a, a cool touch to solve that problem. Yeah, and something to say about the action bar. I think there's a lot of ways that we can play with, with action bars to be to be to be differentiating within applications and and this is a very good example and you have a lot of examples on Android in general so in Play for instance we decided to put a flat icon instead of the 3D icon in the action bar we made those action bar very flashy we just we kind of invested in them and we invested in the colors that we have at the same time when you get to an artist you kind of feel that that is the artist page it's not the music page and so it has to belong to the artist and that's why it has to feel as more neutral as possible and like I said before there are a lot of examples on Android today about different usage of action bar that can make our layout very flexible another example that I can remember for example is the agenda view on a calendar where the action bar on a phone where the action bar shows one of the items of the agenda view itself and so it shows the information present in there. It doesn't have any calendar icon, uh, and it's just part of the informational structure of of the page. Uh, same goes with the people application, where in the in, in the detail in in a, in, a, in a contact card of a people application, the action bar takes the name of the person, and it doesn't. It's not just the empty real estate uh, to have an app for them. So I really invite everybody to think about ways that we can play with the action bar by still keeping it consistent because that really affects usability. So it's important to obviously stick to the patterns. 
Yeah, definitely. I think it's one of the best ways you can bring branding to your application as well, right? You have this this bar there, which is persistent. So I think you've done a really nice job in the play apps so that it's obviously a suite of, uh, you know, very kind of closely, like close cousins apps. You can tell that they're designed together in concert, but they have their own personality throughout through the different colors and so forth. So uh, I think that's a really nice use of the action bar to bring that branding to each individual app. There's some other tricks that we made with color uh, that you can pay attention to. For example, we have a set of affordances like the pinning icon and other icons that uh, change color according to the application you're in. So on music, everything is styled to be orange. In books, everything is styled to be blue. In magazines, everything is styled to be purple. And same goes even with the touch feedback. If you pay attention to the music app, the touch feedback is actually an orange overlay, while on the books application is a blue overlay. There are a lot of little touches that we put here and there to make each application to feel very playful, but also part of the same uh, family. One quick thing I wanted to point out for the developers that are in the audience, if you're looking to do some sort of kind of uh, accent color uh, styling of your app, and you know, if you get you know, some specs or mocks from a, from a designer that says, hey, everything should be a you know, certain accent color, brand color, um, you can use a tool called Android Hollow Colors and the, also the action bar style generator to do that for you. Right, so I think uh, I think we might have run over a little bit, but um, that was some wonderful content that you guys have presented to us. So thank you very much for being our guest today and coming and presenting that. Uh, so that's all for this week. Thanks very much for joining us once again on Android Design in Action, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye, everybody.